Hello YouTube, this is Star, and I am back after a very short break to talk about Dawn Trail. I wanted to talk about my initial thoughts on the new expansion and some of the problems that I noticed with it, and I didn't script anything, this is just off the cuff, you know, as I think of it, um, but I, I really wanted to talk about this. So I apologize if I ramble or go off track or anything like that. I'm going to try and keep it as on point as I can, but um, sorry in advance. First of all, a couple of caveats. There will be spoilers, obviously, for Dawn Trail, so if you want to avoid them, I don't know why you clicked on this video, please click off uh, and watch it later. The other thing is, I'm going to be very critical in this video, and I'm going to say a lot of things that sound like I don't like this, uh, but I love Final Fantasy. I love 14 more than almost any other game. And everything that I say, all of the criticisms that I'm going to give are out of love. And I want to make that very clear in the beginning because it's going to sound pretty negative and I'm going to get very heated, I think. But I, ju I just want you to know I don't dislike it. I liked Dawn Trail. I like all of the expansions. I even like the base game, which most people don't like. And you can see me defending it in another video I made. But I just want to be very clear about that from the beginning. So please don't think I'm attacking the game. I'm not. I want to see it improve and I want to see these problems fixed. And that's why I'm talking about them. So with those two things out of the way, uh, let me just go over real quick my kind of initial thoughts and overall impressions of Dawn Trail. I guess first off, I, like I said, I like it. It's basically what I thought it would be, which is character focused. It was more about the personal stories of Wuklamat and about her family and Kryle and Arendelle. There's not really a big bad, which I was expecting by the end they would have introduced a new big bad, but they didn't. And I was a little surprised by that. I thought they would be setting that up for the future because we do need some kind of overarching evil to fight against or some so, some kind of reoccurring antagonist that we can kind of latch on to. Uh, and I was surprised that they didn't do that. Um, they kept it pretty much self-contained. It was overall fun. I, I loved the level 95 dungeon, best dungeon in the expansion and one of the best in the games. Uh, it, the the music, the atmosphere, that walk up to the the gate to the Golden City was amazing. Just, it was gorgeous. I felt the environmental designs were really, really good this time. The music was mostly good. There were some tracks that I just didn't even notice, which doesn't usually happen with me. I usually pay a lot of attention to the music, but I f there were some of them just kind of fell under my radar. They, they didn't really stand out, I guess, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I kind of expect more uh, from 14 in that area. Combat really, really improved over Endwalker. Uh, and, and actually, I went back and I played a few trust dungeons so I could level some of my characters up so I can use them again in Dawn Trail. And the difference between the dungeons in Endwalker and how slow they are and the dungeons in Dawn Trail and how fast they are was just night and day. It was amazing. The new trials are great. Uh, I love the 97 trial. It hit really well. And the extremes are also really fun. So the combat is good again. So that's not about the story. That's just what I feel about the rest of everything. In terms of the story, I, I thought there would be more focus on Kryle and Arendelle. They did get a lot of focus after, like, post-Dawn post, net, post Dawn Servant stuff in the second half. They, they did get some focus, but I thought, you know, Kryle especially, I thought we would get a lot more focus on her and her parents. And it, it feels like they, they kind of, like, saved it for the last minute and kind of brushed over it. And we're like, yeah, here, this is the whole thing. And it's in the last three, you know, three levels. And I was a little disappointed by that. I I know some people don't like Wuklamat, but I, I liked her. And I liked her relationship with her family. I liked just the whole learning to be a leader, so, like, theme that they had going on. But the execution was tame. If, if, if I can use that word. Uh, I really wish they would have referenced something like Watership Down, which is a really great book on different types of leadership and how that affects the people underneath them. Because for, like for an example, Zeruljah 
Zoralja, sorry, Zoralja, um, was an awful leader, right, to his people. And they make point of talking about this. And we do see at the end that he starts, like, eating their souls and shit um, to make himself stronger. But we don't see how his leadership affects their day-to-day life, which kind of lessens the impact of his status as a leader. So they call him the king of resolve, but that doesn't mean anything because he didn't do anything. He just made soldiers and ate some souls right before his trial where he died. Like, the execution was very weak. I did not like that he had a kid. That really, really bothered me. It just did not make sense to me. And I, every time that child showed up at a cutscene, I was like, why does this exist? Why is he here? Uh, the scenes that he was in were good scenes. And the emotional impact of of him and Wuk Lamont, you know, mourning together as um, Zerul Jaw dies was really good. I liked that. But always in the back of my mind, I was thinking, why does this child exist? Because there was not really a reason character-wise. There was not really a reason plot-wise. It did not work for me. But to go back to the theme of leadership real quick, we saw a lot with Bogul Jada. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, we saw a lot of his influence over the different areas, and I thought that was very well done. We did not see very much of Wuklamat acting as a leader. We saw her learning what she needs to do as a leader, but we didn't see a lot of her acting as a leader to those people. They appreciated that she tried to get to know them, but she did not really prove that she could take care of them. So it was more about her amiability and her ability to get along with people more than her ability to actually make decisions for them and make sacrifices on their behalf. I did feel that she had some good character growth, but I felt like it was underplayed and sometimes kind of got lost in the repetition. So there were some repeated instances of, you know, teaching her the same thing. And so it kind of reduced the impact of her learning those lessons. Overall, I liked it. I did get ARR vibes from the first half where you're just going around and meeting all the different peoples and the focus is on the setting itself and not really on the story. And like the story is there and it's better than A Realm Reborn in having coherency and consistency in the theme, but it did still feel settings focused and it felt like we were not really, we didn't really have very strong goals. We had a goal, but we didn't have a strong goal with a lot of tension. And in fact, at one point I thought that they would have some kind of twist in the middle. I was waiting for something to happen to Wook Lamont. I thought that, you know, she would get injured or something crazy would happen and maybe she'd die in, and then Kalana would take over, you know, and we'd have to go on some like crazy adventure. But no, they just played it straight. And, and that's not necessarily bad that they played it straight, but it was a little underwhelming and it was okay. That's, that's Dawn Trail. It was okay, which is, I expect more from 14. I expect more from this team because they've proven that they can give more. And so that was kind of disappointing. Another thing that really disappointed me was that we never fought Thancred and Orianje. Like, why? Why? Like, I was looking forward to it. I thought 100% if they were going to be, they were on the opposite team and they set that up at the beginning. And it seemed like the, like an obvious logical conclusion would be that we'd end up fighting them and not like they're evil, we're good, but friendly bout as we both try and reach the same goal. Like I thought there would be some kind of like battle royale type thing happening. And it, it was just not there. And I was so disappointed that, you know, I thought for sure it would be the 93 trial. The 93 trial would be us versus Orange and um, Bankrid. And it would be kind of like Anamorphosis, uh, where we fought 
you know, that version of Thancred. I thought it would be kind of like that, where we'd be like, oh my god, it's Thancred and Uriyanji. Ah! But they didn't do that. We didn't even get an instance where we fought them. And I think that was the number one most disappointing thing to me, because it just felt like they held back. Like, they didn't have to hold back like that. And and that could have been very fun. And I, I wonder if they were afraid of people being upset about fighting them. But if it was all in good fun, like we had a battle royale with Raoban back in the Ishgard story. Like we got to fight against Raoban and that was really fun and really cool. Like, why couldn't we have that? I, I don't know what what the decision behind that was, what the reason behind that was, but that was extremely disappointing to me. I'm not a big fan of Western, so I didn't really like the Texas area, but that's totally personal preference. And I know a lot of people that enjoyed it a lot. It just, it didn't, didn't really hit for me. And the one kid in the, the, the Western town, he just looks like Tintin and that's all I can see. And so I just, I couldn't stop seeing that the entire time. And, uh, so I, yeah, so that kind of bothered me. Things I liked, I liked Alexandria. I liked Svein. At first, I was kind of like trying to suss her out, like, okay, do we trust her or not trust her? I thought that was good. I thought, you know, her story was pretty interesting. Some of the execution was a little flat, but uh, I liked her. I loved Otis. I think Otis is going to be a fan favorite. I think it's pretty obvious. He's he's good fun. Diner reference, 100%. Nine is my favorite, so this was a great great expansion for that. I liked Alexandria. I liked the story that they made for it, the version for 14 that they made. I thought all of that was great. I also really, really enjoyed the Golden City mystery box. Uh, this is one of the few instances that I felt like a mystery box was actually done well, where you're introduced to the concept and then you get to see the gate but you can't get to the other side of the gate and you're introduced to this idea of someone being on the other side and you kind of get an idea of what it's going to be and you kind of can see what's there but you don't really know and you're kind of waiting and you're you're filled with like this anticipation of what it's going to be and then you get to living memory and you're like wow this is crazy and you had all these ideas of what that place would look like and it looks really great it looks cool. I liked the idea that you had to destroy it. I liked that concept and I liked how they executed that. I thought that was really good in line with the theme. That whole part was really fun. I definitely cried at the end when Aaron Bell had to say goodbye to his mother. That broke me 100%. It was supposed to and it worked. That was the only time I cried actually in Dawn Trail. I didn't even cry over the, the genocide babies and I'll explain why. That one didn't really do anything for me, but that's mostly because I was looking at it in terms of the narrative reasons for why that happened and that didn't really do me. Kryle and her parents, that worked really well. I thought that was great. Speaking of the Scions, they were absolutely wasted. Just wasted. They didn't do anything, and they had really no purpose other than being there in the trials. Um, like I said, I was really disappointed that we didn't fight Sancred and Oriange. I thought that would have been a great character moment. That would have been a great, you know, fun thing to have happen during our vacation. Like, why wouldn't we want to just duke it out with our buds to see who's stronger? And of course, we're stronger, but like just have fun with it. I, I thought they were wasted. And the twins too, they were there, but they weren't there. They were just hanging around in the background. And I just, and I just really, I really felt like we could have done more with them. I really felt like there was opportunity to give them little moments at least, but those moments were all taken up by the new characters. I, I feel like they might have overdone it with the focus on the new characters. And they could have, been a little more balanced in who they gave screen time to and how much screen time. I feel like there wasn't very much balance in screen time. Like I said, there were some parts that I really loved and some parts that I had issues with, but I was able to overlook and some things that kind of brought me out of it completely. Only two things brought me out of it completely. Zoral Jaws, Baby, brought me out of it 100%. And the actually it's just the mamul jaw stuff with the the babies being genocided to make the twin-headed mamul jaws like that annoyed me so anyway overall i enjoyed it i enjoyed it like i enjoyed a realm reborn where i didn't 
want to think too deeply about it. And if I didn't think too deeply about it, it was really fun adventure vacation time. But if I started to think about the plot itself, I started to get upset. And that's actually why I ended up making this video was because right after I finished the game, I was like, yeah, that's good. Solid like 8.5 to me. Eight, you know. But the more I thought about it and the more I thought about the way things happen and the problems in the plot progression, the less I liked it, which is not what you want to have happen. <laughs> That's not good. So now it's sitting around a seven. It's a solid seven. But let's talk about the problems. So there's one problem that I've noticed in CBU3's work, both in 14 and in 16, after I played that last year. And this is an overarching problem that they have in their writing that they really, really need to fix. So that's one. The other problem is one with Dawn Trail specifically, which really lowered my estimation of the expansion overall and the story because I could see that this problem is going to persist into the future if they don't nip it in the bud right now. So let's talk about the first problem. The problem that I've seen since the beginning of 14 and in 16 as well is a problem with pacing. And this is a longstanding issue that people have brought up over and over again is weird pacing. You have high highs and low lows and you've got these weird points where things like drag on. You had the Loperitz. Uh, section. You had some of the Alamigo parts in Stormblood. You had the trolley section, which I would say the trolley section is probably the best of all of them because it still aligns with the overall theme of Shadowbringers. So that one is probably the least egregious example of that. But you have all these examples of the pacing being very strange. And it was really apparent in 16 and in Dawn Trail. And I would say N. Walker was pretty bad for the pacing as well. So, so why does this happen? This is a problem in your plot progression and in how you transition between subplots. So transitions are known to be very difficult to do well. Transitions are one of the hardest things for any writer to do naturally without people noticing that they're happening. So what ends up happening in, in 14 and 16 is instead Instead of transitioning, one subplot ends and the other just starts and they like switch between things and they go back and forth and they kind of interrupt each other. And that's something that I mentioned in my Realm Reborn video where I said that interrupted tension was a big problem and that continues to be a problem for them, although not to that extent anymore. I think they're, they're better about it now. So one of the main reasons that this happens is that your subplots are not about the same things. So in a good story, what you want to have is a main theme and sub themes that kind of feed into the main theme. So I'll use Shadowbringers as an example of a good main theme and how all of the subplots feed into that. So the main theme of Shadowbringers is the cost of sacrifice. So we see that in the Crystal Exarch's character and his arc and his travel from the future to the past and how the sacrifices of the people that got him there led him to be the person that he is and to care so much about the first and his own role being very sacrificial right? It ties into Emmett Selk's story where he is weighed down by the sacrifices of the ancients and he feels responsible for carrying on what they wanted because of how much they sacrificed. It's in Ardbert's story where he and his team, uh, his companions, sacrificed themselves to save the world and he survived and now he has the weight of their sacrifices on his shoulders and he wants to make things right again and he's feeling kind of the guilt over their failure to save their world. It's in Minfilia's story where she has become this oracle and she's sacrificing herself over and over again and sacrificing the women that she basically inhabits and their lives and the cost of that to the new Minfilia, to Reen, and how she has to deal with that and how Thancred has to deal with that. This theme is in all of the role quests 
right? All of those characters also go into this theme of the cost of their sacrifices and how that affected them as people and how it affected the people around them. So Shadowbringers has the strongest plot progression of all of the expansions because everything feeds into the main theme. There is nothing that is left out. Even the trolley section, which people tend to not like, that also feeds into this because Magna is dealing with the sacrifice of his wife and how her death ended up giving them a way to save the world in the end, you know, through a series of circumstances. So that also aligns with the main theme. All of the other expansions struggle with this, with kind of connecting everything to the main theme because there are a lot of times subsections and subplots that don't align with the main theme. And in Dawn Trail, for example, we have the main theme is coming into leadership, is being a leader. So what does it mean to lead your people? And we see a lot of examples of that. We see it in, I can't remember, the two-headed guy, his leadership and how he affected all of the different tribes in Toral. And we see it in Wuk Lamont and how she grows into being a leader, as well as Kawana and how he grows into being a leader, how Zoralja becomes a bad leader, right? Because of his focus on himself and proving himself, how Svein became a bad leader because of an overabundance of empathy and an inability to let go of the sacrifices that others made. So these are all examples of leadership right, and how leadership can go well or go poorly based on the decisions that the leaders make. The problem is not everything in Dawn Trail feeds into that main theme. There's like a sub-theme about family, and there's a sub-theme about dealing with loss, and these sub-themes don't really connect to the main theme. So what ends up happening is you talk about one theme, and then you drop that theme to talk about the other theme, and then you drop that theme to talk about the other thing. And you end up, instead of with a flowing natural progression, the plot doesn't progress, it does one thing, then it does another, then it does another. And that's how you end up with weird spaces where nothing seems to be happening because you are not progressing along the main theme. You are actually progressing on a different theme that maybe you don't really see the connection between those two things. And what I've noticed from the CBU3 team is that they think in terms of lore and in terms of I like concepts, but they don't really think in terms of storytelling. So, so as an example, okay, when 16 was first announced and when they were going through some of their, their um, explanations of the new features and things like that, they, they introduced the active time lore, uh, which I think they were very, very proud of. And it is an interesting concept, but as a storyteller, I was immediately on alert about that. I thought that was a very bad sign because if you have to remind your audience about what is happening in the story, you are not telling the story well. They should be able to follow along smoothly without having to stop and be like, wait, who's that? Wait, what's going on? Wait, what's happening here? It is a good thing if you've stepped away from the game for a while and you want to come back. You know, it's good for a refresher, but you can also use like journal logs as a quick refresher. I don't think there's a need for that kind of feature. That to me was a sign that they don't really see the difference between lore and storytelling because they thought if we explained lore in this active time lore thing, then that will help them understand the story. But that is not true. You need to tell the story in the story. They have a lot of great concepts and a lot of great lore and a lot of great ideas. And they want to use all of those ideas. So they kind of stick them all together into the story and then mash them together until they make sense in a three-act structure. This is good lore, bad storytelling. The execution ends up being wonky because the ideas don't always fit together. And I, I really think that Aside from maybe Ishikawa, there's not really anyone that understands plot progression very well. It doesn't seem, it seems like there's a lot of people that understand lore, 
but not a lot of people that understand storytelling. And this is kind of the difference between, like, in the sciences between biology and physics, right? They're both sciences. We both we need both to understand the world, but they don't serve the same purpose and they don't do the same things. And we have a lot of biology people and not a lot of physics people in in the writing teams. So it really concerns me uh, when I keep seeing the same storytelling problems over and over again when they've been working on the same project for 10 years uh, and they they should know how to tell these stories by now but i think they don't have anyone with like actual long writing experience and if they do then i'm very sorry to insult them but i feel like it's not it's not working <laughs> oh, gosh I, I sound so negative i sound so mean <laughs> I promise I don't want to be mean. I just care a lot about stories and I it just bothers me when I see these story problems. Okay, I'll give you an example of a story problem. I'm going to use the genocide babies. That's what I'm calling them. But the Mamulja have been basically trying to breed the, the two-headed variant. There's a very low likelihood of one being born and it's like one in 100 babies and the ones that... that are not born die in in their eggs i think and this is an interesting concept right it's a very interesting idea and there's a lot that can go into this the problem was in the execution because for one thing what is his name the the leader guy bagul jaja or whatever his name is how is it that for 80 years he did nothing about this how is it that he stopped a war between the two peoples and he knew what the war was about and he was one of the two heads that the others would listen to and he didn't tell them evacuate this place we'll get you a new home we'll, we'll set you up somewhere else you know because you can't live here anymore and it's causing all sorts of problems you know your your food supply problems and all this stuff why was there no aid given to them well how was it that we went in there and in five minutes later after looking at some meteorites and doing a bit of investigation we said oh yeah we can get you some crops that will grow here how was that solved in five minutes by us when it couldn't be solved in 80 years by their actual king how did that happen that is a that is a plot problem that is a problem with how you are telling your story the concept was good the storytelling was bad and the other problem was why did not why didn't they just leave why like i understand having a connection to your 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 homeland and wanting to stay there but if it is literally killing you and there is nothing that is stopping you because they've stopped their war uh, their civil war with um, the cat people, I don't remember, whatever. If they stop the war, there is nothing stopping them from leaving. And in fact, many of them do leave and they go to the capital and they go to other places. Why? There is nothing that is stopping them from setting up somewhere else. There, there are no, from what we understand, from what we've been told, there are no like resource issues. There's no lack of land. Um, it was just we don't want to leave because we love this place. Well, if you, why would you love this place if it's killing you? Why would you love this place if it is causing you to destroy your own children, your own progeny? There was no real reason, no strong reason. There was a reason, but it was not a strong reason why they wanted to stay there. And this destroyed the concept for me because I could see all the holes in it. So this is a reoccurring problem where they, they want to use concepts, but they don't know how to execute them in a way that makes sense. And that's how you end up with those very high highs and very low lows, because the highs are just the rule of cool, right? It's a cool thing happen, an interesting thing happen, an amazing thing happen. But it's not that everything was leading up to this. And this is why people like Shadowbringer so much, because everything was leading up to that. Like everything led up to, like your whole journey led up to you killing Valthry. It led up to you fighting Hades. Like everything went in line to push you towards that inevitable end. And you knew it was coming and you could see it a mile off and you could see how you got there. And that was good plot progression. It wasn't just about, we have a cool concept that we want to use. And so we're going to put it in the story, which 
ended up happening a lot in Dawn Trail and really dragged the pacing of the story down because the concepts don't fit together. They don't add to each other. They just stand next to each other. So there's no real sense that we're getting somewhere, that we're going in a direction. There was some sense, and I think like they do understand how to make a three-act structure, how to make a plot move in a certain way, but the expertise is missing. Instead of feeling like a woven tapestry, it feels like jigsaw puzzle pieces that have been smashed together and kind of fit, but not really when you actually look at the, the end result. So that's the first problem is that CBU3 tends to focus more on lore over the execution of the lore. They're much better at making the ideas and the characters and the world than they are at making those things progress through a story. The stories are good, I'm not saying they're bad, but there are obvious areas where it all kinds of fall, falls to pieces when you think about it. Um, and as a storyteller, there, there are a lot of places where I can just tell that the story does not work. These things do not fit together. The transitions are bad. Things don't transition. Like, as an example, right, when you finish the 95 dungeon, right, you are introduced to the gate to the Golden City, you are given a short speech about how, you know, all things will be revealed, you know, in time. It's just like, fine, sure, even though, you, why can't you just tell us now, whatever. And then Wuklamat has her ascension with a very, very long speech and no ceremony. That was weird to me. There was no ceremony. It was just her speech. I feel like it would have been much better served to have a short ceremony where we could all see it happen rather than having her talk at us. But that's another thing. You know, that's another thing. So she has her speech and chooses Kawana as her head of resolve. And then that whole thing just stops. It just stops. It just ends there. And all of a sudden, we're going to Texas with Erinville. There is no transition. It just one story subplot stops and the other story subplot begins. This is a problem with storytelling. This is a problem with execution. And it doesn't have to be this way. You could make it so that there is a reason connected to the Golden City that you have to go north. It's not like the story's over and we're going on a different adventure now because no, Buklamat comes back. You know, her brother comes back. You end up actually going back to the capital. And so they are still connected, but the transition between them is missing. So I think what they really need to do is they need to balance the, the lore part with the storytelling part, the idea with the execution. Uh, right now, there's not a lot of balance. There's a lot of focus on the, the, con the concepts and not as much focus on the, the, the execution and the storytelling. Okay, so that's problem one. Problem two, which is not a problem that I've seen from them before, but is going to be a problem in the future based on what I've seen in Dawn Trail, it stood out to me immediately once I got to the final area. Final Fantasy XIV has been the Final Fantasy Final Fantasy, right? They have borrowed concepts, they've borrowed um, ideas from the other Final Fantasies and they've used it in their story. So they are kind of copying what's come before them, which is totally fine and it works the way that they do it. Uh, I have not had a problem with it at all in previous expansions, but I had a problem with it this time because they are no longer copying other Final Fantasies, they are not copying themselves. Dawn Trail has many instances where they are copying ideas that came before them. And this is the 10 year problem, right? This is the problem that happens when you have a very long running IP that has a story that is continuous. I noticed this with Wuklamat being the new lease, with Svein being the new Medion, with Living Memory being the new Amarat, with this repeat of the concept of letting things go. They have done this three expansions in a row where the ending is about letting things go. The ending for Emmett Selk was you have to let go of the ancients. The The ending for Meteon was you have to let go of carrying people suffering. The ending for Svein was you have to let go of um, the people who have died 
uh, under you. I mean, it's the exact same thing that Emmett Selk had to learn. It was what Spain had to learn. And it was done in a different enough way that I think there are people that won't notice it. And I think that it, it's not bad yet. But it was something that I noticed is we are now treading the same ground over and over. This is the third expansion where we've done this. And if we keep on this route, we will just be telling the same story over and over again. I'm not asking them to be really original. I'm asking them to pick different themes. The theme of letting go is great. It worked in Shadowbringers. Um, it worked in, in Endwalker. But the third time I was like, okay, we have... We have gone over this before. We have done this before. Can you do something new now? <laughs> so this is the 10 year problem. It's that 14 has been going for 10 years and the story is starting to repeat itself. And this happens for two reasons, really. This happens because the creators want to give the audience more of what they want. And more of what they want is the same as what they've already given. And so you end up kind of repeating things because you think, oh, well, people liked this, so we'll give them more of this. And it's very hard to find a balance between doing something new and doing something familiar. This is the problem with all long running series is getting to that balance. And sometimes they don't get it right and they either become repetitive or they go way out into left field and take really huge risks and change everything and people don't like it. The other reason that this happens is because the same people continue to work on the same project and each individual person only has so many ideas that they can bring to the table and they can bring them to the table in different ways and they can think that they're being, um, you, you know, original in what they're they're putting forward, but they're all along the same lines. So in 14, the same lines tend to be letting go of the past, letting go of loss, which are great themes, but there are only so many times that you can say that before people get really bored with it. So what they really need is to get some fresh blood in there, some new ideas, some new concepts, and to let, you know, let themselves maybe try something different, try something a little more edgy, something a little more risky, you know. I feel like they've become very risk averse in the way that they're telling the story. There was nothing dangerous at all that happened. I was never worried that someone wouldn't make it out of this. It, it seems like they've become risk averse and they don't want to make players so upset that they'll leave. But the problem is that you're going to end up making them so ap apathetic that they give up because there's nothing interesting anymore. And it's, in my opinion, much better to make people angry than it is to make them uncaring. And I think they need to do something like the Bloody Banquet again. And I, I talked about it in my other video where I said that it was good that they hadn't done anything like that again because they ended up walking that back anyway. And, and I said that, you know, they'd learned their lesson. Well, they really, really kind of haven't. They learned not to do that. Um, they learned not to even try, but they really need to have some kind of oh shit moment again. And they need to take that risk and they need to stick the landing and they need to follow through with the consequences. They're very bad about walking back the consequences of things. This is the ramble about that. But anyway, I would like to see them take some more risks and try some things that they think people would be upset about. It doesn't have to be death, you know, take someone's arm off, something like that, I don't know, whatever. But just give us something, you know, because what's going to end up happening is that people are going to start seeing that extended cutscene pop up, you know, the one that says, you know, make sure you have sufficient time set aside to view these cutscenes in their entirety. People are going to see that and they're going to start groaning. For the longest time, it's been oh man, something cool is going to happen, something exciting is going to happen. But in Dawn Trail and in the future, it's going to be, oh god, I have to sit through 30 minutes of cutscenes of people talking at each other and I really, really don't care. And that is bad. That is how you lose people. That is how you have people quit. It's not by making them mad, it's by making them annoyed. So I really hope that they will deal with that and they won't end up repeating themselves again in the next expansion. I know they're setting up, you know, for the future and they've got that that portal key thing and it looks like they're they're making room for a lot of new stories and they're making room for a lot of new places for us to visit, which I think is a great 
great idea and I really am looking forward to that but I really am worried that they're going to keep making these same two mistakes they're going to keep focusing on shoving all of their ideas in even if they don't make sense in the overall or they're going to keep repeating themselves and in their structure and in the concepts and themes so that we end up getting bored because we're like yes I've seen this for the last three expansions but these are my takes on it this is my my thoughts as someone who really loves the art of storytelling and who loves just dissecting stories. I am curious to know what other people thought because they don't really have the same perspective as me and they might not have been bothered by the same things that I was bothered by. And maybe they were bothered by some things that didn't bother me. I think there were people that had very high expectations for Dawn Trail. I did not have high expectations. I I knew that it was not going to be on the level of Endwalker or Shadowbringers because we haven't built up to that yet. I knew that this was going to be kind of a starting out thing. It's going to be very low key. And it was. And most of that was fine for me. It was just these two problems that really bothered me. Anyway, uh, let me know. Uh, what did you think of Dawn Trail? Did you like it? Did you not like it? You know, what what annoyed you? What made you excited? What made you happy? Why is the 95 dungeon the best in the game? You know, um, it's not Amarada's, but yeah. Anyway, thank you for watching all the way in to the end. I'm really sorry. I rambled a lot and I said a lot of stupid stuff. I, I hope that you were able to follow along and, uh, and I promise the next video will be scripted. I probably will not get to another video anytime soon, but I do have plans for the future and I really, really want to talk about Shadowbringers. I really, really want to talk about some more general uh, videos about gaming and storytelling in gaming. Uh, I just gotta, just gotta find the time, man. Just gotta find the time. Anyway, thanks for watching and uh, hopefully I'll see you guys again. Bye.